But yeah, thanks again for, for joining us and welcome to our first virtual learning hour slash business shower. And so a lot of you might know already, but I wanted to give a quick background on what China Registry is and kind of like how we got started hosting business showers to begin with. Um, China Registry is a platform for women who are starting businesses to ask for the things that they need in the style of a wedding registry. The idea is you can ask for a gravy boat when you're getting married. There's all this stuff that you need when you're starting a company. You should be able to ask for that too. So we are building our site with best practices from crowdfunding as well as from traditional registry sites. Um, so new business owners and folks who are uh, supporting existing businesses uh, can ask for their equipment needs as well as you know, just a pep talk or uh, social media engagement, whatever the monetary or non-monetary things that are going to help them survive and thrive uh, are things that they can for on Shine Registry. Um, this has become particularly important more recently um, as a lot of local businesses are facing some pretty major shifts due to COVID-19. Um, and, you know, we are doing what we can behind the scenes to build out new features and things like that. But we also wanted to do programming like this uh, that could really shine a spotlight on uh, the folks who are using our site and otherwise um, who uh, could use a little bit of extra support right now and could use a little bit more structured community care. Um, and we're really, really thrilled to be able to provide some of the tools for that community care. Um, and so with that, on the next slide, I want to introduce Circles Greater Pittsburgh. Um, so the mission of Circles is to inspire and equip the Pittsburgh area, Pittsburgh area families and communities to resolve poverty and thrive. They believe no one should live in poverty. Families and communities can take charge of their destinies, and if given the right tools and support, economic stability can be achieved. Um, and one of the programs that they have built out over the past few years is called Catapult, which is specifically focused on women who are starting businesses. Uh, one of the really cool initiatives that they have out of Catapult is a storefront on Penn Avenue in East Liberty. It's called Gallery on Penn. Uh, so we started working with Circles um, specifically to support the businesses that had previously been working on gallery, out of Gallery on Penn uh, who had access to this great storefront space that allowed for foot traffic as well as other business development uh, purposes. Um, because that storefront is closed down, most of those businesses are now pivoting to being online. Uh, a lot of them are also uh, figuring out like new, uh, new ways of existing with like markets that are no longer um, as uh, as active. Um, this includes like folks who are doing wedding planning, um, folks who are doing uh, like food services, things like that. Rayhan, if you can go to the next slide. And so these are some folks, a few of these people might be familiar from the screen on the side, uh, but these are some of the folks who are involved in Circles and Catapults who uh, have created Shine Registry profiles. Um, I am going to be dropping a link to both uh, the direct donation page for Circles PGH, as well as all of the profiles on Shine Registry that are affiliated with Circles. Uh, this includes a few people that are on the call today. Uh, I think Carrie Ann is on uh, with K Flower Designs. She's in the process of pivoting her wedding design business and seeking a full color laser printer to help with production. Uh, we also have a queen uh, who is the founder of Royally Fit. Uh, <laughs> she's waving. Uh, it's a body positive lifestyle boutique with a focus on holistic health, nutrition, and self-care. Uh, there's also uh, Jasmine Bates. Uh, she's a young entrepreneur behind King of Duncan. Uh, during COVID-19, she has shifted her pet business and begun making cotton masks, which is really exciting. Um, I'm not going to read all of these. There, there are quite a number, um, but one last one. Rainice Kelly of Soil Sisters Plant Nursery is working on uh, working with her sister on dismantling barriers to fresh food and strengthening the sustainability of families in Pittsburgh. Uh, they're seeking gardening equipment and donations to their garden supply giveaway. Uh, they just launched this year and are doing really exciting things things in urban farming. I think anyone who's been in line at the grocery store recently uh, can be really appreciative of their work and really excited about what they're doing. Um, so thanks for letting me share a little bit of that so far. I am, uh, like I said, I'm going to drop that information into the chat and I want to encourage everyone who is on here uh, to look at that. Oh, it's telling me I have too much. Um, I want to encourage everyone who's on here to go through what's listed in the chat 
um, learn a little bit more about these businesses in particular, we're also going to be sharing their information after uh, this event. We will um, we'll be publishing the recording of this to a blog along with the information about the, these companies and really doing whatever we can to use this event to kind of uh, direct traffic their way um, and help support them uh, in, in ways that we can. Um, so with that, I'm going to close out the intro and uh, let Rehan take it from here. Rehan is uh, leading this workshop on what is an app. And I'm particularly excited for him to do that because he's also been working with Shine Registry on helping us redesign the website among other things. Uh, so we've been working really closely and he is one of the most talented developers slash designers that I know. Um, and I'm, I'm really, really excited for, for all the things that he has to share. So. Uh, Thanks, and Rayon, take it away. Thanks, Emily, for that intro. Very kind. So let's see if I can live up to that uh, introduction. So uh, as I mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about so why does everything sort of need an app, and and you'll you'll hear some anecdotes along the way of stuff that we're all going through and some of the applications I've worked with previously, um, and some other interesting tidbits. So just going to start out with this video. We probably remember remember this from quite some time ago at this point. So what about the iPhone? The, um, is that if you the want video that was brought about, I guess, probably close to eight or 10 years ago when Apple started bringing out their phones and everything had an app and that was the, their tagline. There's an app for that, there's an app for that, right? So um, to sort of start here as a, as a nice place set for where, we, where we've come and where we've been. There's an app for just about anything, only on the iPhone. So, it's been it's been a while since since that ad. Um, I remember that one from a while ago, but uh, sort of an interesting pullback to some of what's been done. So a little before we dive too deep into the topic, I'll give you um, a, a little intro as well as as sort. Of, so now we've sort of gotten all these apps, and where have we gone with it? So in some cases, maybe it's gotten out of hand. In some cases, it might be still really valuable and and and, and potentially beneficial to a lot of folks. But before we get too into the topic, I'll give you an intro on myself. So I am, I'm Rehan, as Emily mentioned, I am a designer and developer. Um, I currently uh, work for UPMC Enterprises. So that's the, um, tech, the technology division of UPMC. So I work in the healthcare space, designing a whole bunch of stuff, uh, most currently stuff to help with uh, COVID-19. But these are a bunch of the groups that I've worked with in the past. And it's been a lot of fun, um, lots of different things, ed educational technology, um, enterprise and consumer applications for for uh, major sports leagues and organizations and, and some stuff in between too. So that's sort of my background and a little bit where I'm coming from, pretty um, domain agnostic, if you will. So now backing back into the topic. So how did we get to this world of, of um, app filled everything? Apps for this, apps for that, apps for a little bit of anything you want and everything you want. Um, and I sort of boiled it down to three main pieces. One is increased access for everyone. So the, the devices have gotten cheaper, phones have gotten cheaper, access um, for these things have gotten better. I mean, it's not 100% yet, but it's gotten far more than it used to from, from the days of folks carrying around literal bricks in the 90s, right? So um, that, that's one, one piece. Uh, the other being lower barrier to entry for developers. So it's been easier and easier for people to learn this information and understand how to go about setting up their own infrastructure, their own applications. Um, and, and sort of paired with that is better distribution. So how can folks actually get known and communicate this stuff? So the App Store um, being the biggest one, right? So iOS uh, and Apple has one, Android has one, and those are sort of the biggest mobile, mobile um, app stores and distribution channels, but there's, there's several others as well. So I, I sort of chalk it up to these three things. Um, and like that's super exciting because more people get to play, more people get to talk uh, in, in the space and, and, and build wonderful things. But there's always sort of a, a catch 22, if you will. Um, and I, I, sort of where I go with this is, is well, but not all apps are, are necessarily good, useful, or actually solve a problem. Um, and sometimes that's an issue, sometimes it isn't, right? So you can have fun, goofy apps like one of the ones that came out, I think, when the iPhone first launched was a was a calculator. Um, and it was basically all it did was do one plus one. And it was just to prove a point that like you could make an app for anything you wanted. So not useful, but funny and, and sort of fun to, to show your skills and that kind of thing. 
So if you look at this at like a more, I guess, bigger level of, are we actually solving a problem when we're coming to a lot of the problems that we see now or, or things you probably experience in your daily life? It's like, can we add value to those experiences and take that pain away so that you can better engage with um, your community, your friends, your family, that kind of thing, and do what you need to do. So I found this the other day, which was really wonderful when I was putting these slides together. But um, Michael had, had tweeted this saying, never underestimate, underestimate the value of clearly defining a problem before you begin solving it. So I think that's really well said because there is, there is this um, sort of motivation or, or want to, to really build something fun because you're like, oh, it's cool. Let's try and solve this right away and just put something out there. And I think there's definitely, there's definitely value to that and a workflow around it. But I think it's always good to, in a lot of, especially in, in my industry now in healthcare, is really understand what the problem is before you start building things. Because uh, at that point, it may be sort of a, a, a little late to, to get in front of um, your users or whoever you need to. Um, there's this other wonderful illustration that I, I've used as well, but this sort of talks to what does that really look like? What does it mean to understand a problem? Um, so this talks to the um, the the screen versus non-screen thinking is how has that is how they defined it. But you can sort of imagine this comic walks through opening up a door. Um, so a pretty basic interaction that all of us have probably done probably ten dozen times um, just today or the last couple of days. Um, and it's it's really thinking, okay, what what are you trying to do? Are you trying to get through a threshold like a door? Um, and do you need all this complicated interface to go about doing that? Um, so again, it's, it's really looking at understand the problem before you sort of dive into a technology. Because this is somewhere where, yes, there are app solutions for it, but is that the best solution? Um, and in some cases, maybe, maybe it's the only way to easily have it share with tons of people. Um, so if you have a digital lock or a shared space that needs temporary access, maybe this is the best way, right? Um, but maybe not for your, your home or like a door to your own own bedroom or something, right? Like it's your, your space, you're only letting people in your home that you probably trust, not just random people off the street. So um, there's sort of that piece as well, is really think through that problem. Um, is it, do you need the solution or is it over-engineered? So we'll, we'll talk through a couple of these examples that I found. So uh, you may be familiar with smart bulbs or smart light, light fixtures. So these are like um, Philips Hue makes them. There's a bunch of companies that do it, but you can imagine them as as light bulbs that are connected um, to your network, so your internet connected um, light bulbs. And sort of what they do is they allow you to change the color, set timers, do sort of all these fun things, map them to music, so you can have like a little party in your house, that kind of thing. It's all all cool and and fun pieces. But I think the the piece that really breaks down for me and why I want to call this out is if you use these bulbs, you sort of have to have them always connected. And, and by that, they have to always have power, which means you can't use the switch as you tend to do on the wall, right? So the illustration of someone taping it up, you, you may have seen this in, in your, your own homes or your friend's homes, but people tape up the switches so people don't, don't turn them off because then they can't control them from their phones. So this is sort of the, the case of, well, if I don't have the app installed and I'm not I don't have the login credentials or I forgot or my phone's dead or whatever have you. I now can't do the thing, the basic thing, which is I would like a light source in my space to do that, right? And it's like, why have we created this, this intermediary that's preventing me from doing something basic um, that I would want to do all the time and should have access to? There's value to adding that new functionality with, um, with the colors and sort of the mapping of the lights or sunrise, sunset, right? There's value in that, but like not remove the basic experience that should exist without my, this piece of software, this companion application, if you will, is how I, I'm gonna continue to refer to it. So that's sort of the piece. I know in, 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 in my, my space, whenever I've looked into this, this problem, I've actually thought about it in terms of smart light switches. So they also make smart light switches, which the switch itself is connected um, to the network, not the bulb, so that people can go around and click the switches as intended, and you can still control it with your phone because the, the, the infrastructure that is um, sort of wiring in your house is set up to allow for that kind of interaction. So really don't want to break the interaction for everybody who isn't 
isn't going to be using the phone or using the app or talking to Alexa or whatever have you, but just go about their day as they would expect. Another example in a slightly different um, domain is Pebble Smartwatch. So a couple years ago, um, Pebble, which is one of the sort of leading smartwatch companies, got bought out by Fitbit. And they had a massive community, a really lively community of folks who were really nervous, um, who were saying, okay, great, we've built all these custom apps. Some of them really great. Um, some of them were monitoring glucose levels and, and other, other like medical things for, for folks as they went about their day. So they didn't have to go about doing this, um, sort of explicitly like pull out their phone or, or do a reading themselves, that kind of thing. But if, if their platform and their company sort of disappears, what happens to that software, right? I still have the physical device, I can still wear it, but does it still do all the things that were expected? Um, and in Fitbit's case, there was, there was a plan to remove some of those features and not support it to the same level they were. Um, and, and that was sort of uh, problematic for a lot of folks. So there was a third party group that actually just kind of made an open source, a, a free, free and open platform to continue to build applications. But it, it begs the question about sort of um, the dependency on one platform or the connectivity between um, one device and its software around it. So th in this case, it's, they're pretty connected. Um, like the, the watch had a, a lot of value in software, but you can imagine things that sort of don't need an application like a toaster, right? Like, can you imagine if the only way you could use your toaster was if the application like that would be super annoying because if they stopped making that app, okay, now what? I can't use my toaster? Like that would be really silly. And unfortunately this has happened, um, not necessarily in the toaster case, but it's happened with things like uh, skateboards and scooters where they've tied it so close to their software that you couldn't use the product after they sort of stopped supporting that part of their business, either because they were small and, and got bought out or or other things they, they thought it wasn't part of their business model anymore. So there's always this sort of fight between how much is software, how much is hardware, how can we best adapt it? And we'll get into some of the, the business reasons of why that occurs and maybe some of the considerations is, as we build our own uh, organizations or, or work in, in larger organizations, how we wanna adapt and, and handle this. Um, most recently, um, Dark Sky, which is a, a very popular weather application, got bought out by Apple. So um, maybe some of you guys have this on your phone, but a lot of people talk about this, this application. And when Apple bought them out, again, there was concerns that they were going to shut down a lot of the extra features. So uh, right out the door, the Android application got removed. So you can no longer use it on Android. You can still use it on, on iOS, but if you're a new user, you can't do it on, on Android. Um, and there's a lot of third parties. So other weather applications, other groups of people that connect to their APIs. Um, and and um, API being the connection point to access their data. So if you're looking for sort of wind conditions, that kind of thing, you could collect that type of data through an API, um, through like a data connection on the back end. So if I'm writing my own weather app, I could use the Dark Sky API to get this, this information about different um, weather data so that I don't have to go and source it myself, right? And I think, I think that talks to, similar to the previous cases, is that dependency between the two applications. In this case, there's a third-party dependency or a personal dependency on the application, but is there a reliance too heavily on one source or one supplier? And I think that concept carries for a lot of things. And, and we've noticed this even, especially in COVID-19 sort of world, is when these factories were shutting down across the board or, or offices and, and people's livelihood organizations were shut down, the things they were producing came to sort of a stop, right? So the dependency for one versus many is something to consider. In some cases, we don't have a choice. Sometimes we do, but these are sort of, I guess, things to consider um, both from a software and sort of a, a supply chain piece. Um, so, so again, right, like what happens when, when software starts being supported? Is the hardware dead or are there other services that you now have to rely on? So in the case of the toaster, that'd be super annoying. Um, in the case of something that truly requires 
Um, a network connection, okay, like the product's sort of end of life now. Um, that makes that makes sense, right? Like, can we still use those those sort of brick-like phones that were made in the 90s? No, because the infrastructure doesn't exist. And I feel like there's there's sort of a gray area of what that means, but that that's sort of a fair fair piece of okay, this product has hit end of life, um, and we can sort of move to the next piece of technology um, to to go from there. But don't get me wrong, I'm, I don't hate apps. <laughs> Uh, I, I use them all the time. I <laughs> design several of them um, uh, for, for healthcare and for lots of other folks, but I just want to make sure we don't make them crutches to the experience. They should add value, but don't hinder um, the regular reuse outside of that, like the light switch example, right? Um, make sure there's a fallback that other folks can, can use it, or if that part of the product doesn't get supported anymore, you can still sort of go about your day and, and continue to use the product that you bought and, and want to use. So now we'll talk through um, a couple of examples that I've seen that are actually do this quite well. So we talked about some sort of goofy examples or examples where maybe this could have been done better. And now we'll talk through some examples where, where it, does it does it right in my view. So this is a, a lamp, like a table lamp. Um, I actually have this lamp, so it's kind of nice, but it's a, a simple lamp that I I don't know where I got, I think Walmart or something. Really nice looking. Um, but what they did was they have a physical dial on it that accounts for, I think, almost every, if not every function that you need to, to do. So you can turn it on, you can adjust brightness, you can adjust the color temperature. So if it's white light versus yellow light um, and all, all these kinds of things that you can do sort of on, on the device itself. No need for a phone, no need for an app, no need to hassle with logins and such. But what they did do was they said, okay, great, we're gonna network connect it anyways. So if you wanna control it through timers or such, you can, and we'll add some other features. Like in, in this case, the screen that's being shown here is a Pomodoro uh, timer. So sort of a way to help you go through your day of working for 45 minutes and, and taking a break for 10 and these kinds of things. Um, so they added features additionally that may bring value to some users and may mm, other folks may not be bothered by. So personally, I've never used their application. Uh, I think I used it just to understand like how do they design it? What does it do? But I've never used it in any real way. But I've used the lamp uh, just based on the dial that's on it. And, and I can continue to do what I need to do regardless if they, they continue to support their application. So again, that companion app being added value rather than taking away from sort of the basic um, needs that you may have. Another one is a fridge. So we all probably open this thing several times a day and you'll probably notice there's a little light somewhere in there um, that tells you, hey, change your water filter if you have a water filter in your fridge. And it normally is like a little label towards the top or something that says water uh, filter indicator and and it says, okay, this green means good and uh, yellow means order a filter and red says change it, right? Something to this effect. And then you, when you change it, you either push the little light button and it resets it. So in this case, there's a screenshot of an application here that um, LG does for some of their network connected fridges. And it says, it's time to change your um, air filter. You can purchase a new one here um, and here's a promo code. So. Uh, in the case that you could imagine that that says water filter instead of air filter, but imagine if you got a notification on your phone and said, here's the link, this is the model number, here's the specific one you need to get, um, we can help you just take care of it right away. Um, that, that's added value, right? But we haven't removed sort of the piece of, if I open the fridge and I'm still like, oh, where is this filter, what is it? I can take it out, read the label, go to Home Depot, like find the model and pick it up and come home. But this could say, oh, I'm, I'm not planning to go out in the next couple of days, or in our case, probably a couple of weeks at this point. But uh, you, can, you can order order directly, and you don't have to hassle with model numbers and variants of, oh, is it this one? Is it that one? Is it the right size, et cetera? So there's added value, but again, we haven't removed value. So if, if they stop supporting their app or I didn't want to use it, I can still go about doing it um, the way I've always intended. So. So the, the, the added value piece without the removal of sort of the basics is, is what's valuable here. So ease of action and the main notification, meaning that light is still where it is and where you expect it to be. 
So now that we saw some sort of good and bad examples, why does, why does this kind of stuff happen? Um, why are we building these pieces and, and why, why are these, these things happening overall across the board? Why are some great experiences, some poor experiences? And we can link this to what I'm gonna call the, these four sort of um, business cases. Um, there's cost of the consumer, so the retail price when you go buy it. Um, volume of sale, so how many of these items they can, they can sort of sell. And, and that's sort of directly related to the cost to you. Um, and then post launch press and post launch features. So meaning once they've announced the product, they get their press out there. You like, uh, especially for some big tech companies like Apple and Google, they have their regular sort of cadence. So every October, new phone, people talk about it a couple of weeks and then everyone moves on with their life. So that's what I mean by when I say post launch, like outside of that couple of weeks, how can they get more press and how can they get um, more features? And those are directly connected, right? If I can get more features, I'll probably get press because people will talk about the new thing. And, and so we'll go from here and we'll talk through what that looks like. So we'll take the first two cost to you and volume, and then we'll look at sort of the post launch press and, and features section as well. So you guys may have heard about this sort of data currency um, versus dollar currency is what it should say. Um, but the, the data currency versus dollar currency, meaning how can we, the cost to you in terms of dollars versus the cost of your data. So uh, companies like Facebook, companies like Twitter, a lot of the social media organizations, the, the reason they can make their services free um, is sort of twofold. One is they're selling ads, but they're selling ads that are targeted, meaning they're collecting information about you and they're knowing where to put ads. So I'm probably more likely to get ads about technology and about software because that's a lot of what I look up because that's what I do full time. You also, I'll probably get a lot of stuff around design stuff. So the likelihood of me buying something in that space is probably higher than maybe someone like Emily. Um, possibly, I'm making this up, but <laughs> it, it's very possible. So that's, that's a consideration they're making and how they're doing that is, you may have seen this, um, it was from about a year ago, the TV prices were getting so low and the reason they could do it was because they were collecting data on what you were watching, how long the TVs were on, things of that, and presenting you ads. So uh, in this case, um, this is calling out Vizio. So I think this was just about a year ago in April, they got sort of caught um, and, and said, um, yep, this is, this is what's happening. And the funny thing is nothing, no problem other than it was not well communicated, but it was communicated in their terms and conditions. So we all agreed to it, but no one read it, but it was there. Um, so they weren't doing anything illegal. They weren't doing anything wrong but they weren't doing it in a way that was sort of human accessible. Um, and this is sort of how they balanced making these TVs so cheap. I mean, they were probably hundred bucks or 200 bucks or whatever they are. That's relatively cheap for such a, such a, such the technology in this day. And, it, and they were doing that by selling ads and doing something behind the scenes. And keep, keep that in mind that data currency versus the sort of dollar currency as we go through this, cause that'll, that'll come up again. Um, you may have seen this too. This is, this is a quite old article now, but I think it's almost three or four years old. But Uber was doing something similar where um, they were charging people higher prices, surge pricing, if your phone was low on battery. Uh, because they said, oh, if you're low on battery, you're probably needing this ride. We can charge you more. You're more likely to say yes. Right. So they got caught and people got really upset about it. So um, I don't think this is a problem anymore. But uh, they quickly got rid of that. And actually Apple and Google, I think both restricted um, sharing battery level data with, with uh, the applications. So again, another sort of sneaky way of them trying to collect or, or add value. So you may not have seen this um, and, and who knows what they did with it. We can sort of guess, but you can imagine that your, your daily rides were five, two percent, five or five percent, two percent cheaper because they were doing this to the 20 percent of their population that was sort of out on the weekends late in the night and they're like, oh, I need to go home, right? So they could they could manipulate the, the prices and, and distribute it, if you will. Um, that's what I'm guessing is, is how they did it and that would allow them to say, we have cheap rides and get more people like on their platform. There's this project, so I'll just look at this image for a second while I drink some water. 
there was a project that was done by a student um, who's part of the ITP program at NYU. I forgot what ITP stands for, um, but it's a wonderful project, um, which was this dress piece. And what it did were the panels um, that you see in the white section behind the sort of black looking plastic mesh, they were electrochromatic panels, meaning if you um, put an electrical current through them, they would change opacity. So you could have them sort of see through or, or white. Um, and what she did was she sort of had a, a thought exercise or a statement on privacy to say, I'm going to track all of the data that leaves my phone and go somewhere. And every time some data gets lost, I will turn off and decrease the uh, transparent or increase transparency of the panels. So you physically, you could see more of her and it was like, here, now your data is naked in the same way. So she was making a statement about like the digital world that's not as obvious and making a sort of physical version of that that you could understand and visualize um, as a piece around. So I think this is probably five or six years ago at this point, but I always find it a very interesting uh, project because it's, it's, it's an abstract concept. It's not necessarily known, right? There's all this stuff that happens like terms and conditions goes above all of our heads. Um, you gotta be a lawyer basically to know what most of that means. But um, in the same way, like where's this data going? Who's using it for what? Um, this was, a, I think a great example of some way to, to see and understand what that is. Uh, and most recently we're talking about privacy. This is the last privacy example. You may have heard about Apple and Google teaming up to make a um, contact tracing um, API. Uh, meaning some way for, for them to collect um, in an interaction between two, two devices, two phones. So um, if your sort of Bluetooth was in range, it would say, oh, there's a sort of uh, basically a serial number would get passed between the devices and they would say, oh, okay, um, that's recorded. And if anyone, um, so they would keep a log of that. So let's say if one, one, one of the individuals was, became COVID positive, that that message would get translated to say, hey, you came in contact with somebody um, who was COVID positive, you may wanna go check it out. And sort of that's the level of information they would pass. And a lot of folks are, are sort of very nervous about what this looks like um, because they're like, what does that mean? Is this full data? What, like, what does that look like? Um, and I think uh, I'm not gonna talk about what that, what that means or if it's good or bad, but it's, it's a piece of, just this kind of stuff now coming out is a lot more folks are sort of aware um, of privacy concerns and what that looks like and unfortunately have gotten burned by some of the previous interactions right like people selling your data uber taking advantage of it so people are far more aware and um i think i can't remember at this point but gdpr um which is the european union's um governing rule set for data um, came out a couple of years ago and sort of in place to say, hey, look, guys, you can't abuse data the same way you used to. We're going to put laws around what that looks like. And if you don't abide, we're going to put massive fines on you. So when it first rolled out, um, a lot of the big tech companies had to pay massive fines because they didn't, they didn't follow all the rules properly. So I'm glad to see governing bodies taking a, taking a look at this. Um, but I guess on the flip side, we as consumers have to be sort of informed as well and see if we can understand what it is they're trying to do or why, why or why not um, that it's a valuable or, or not valuable thing. So now we'll switch gears a little bit to the post-launch press and post-launch feature set. So I think one really good example is, is Tesla. So they obviously sell cars, but why have they become so popular or what are they doing different from the rest of the industry? So of course, electric, right? Like that's that's one of their, their big things. But honestly, I think bigger than that is their software. So they have really become a software technology focused organization that I like to say they're a software company that happens to make cars. So it's computer first, car after the fact. Um, and, and because that's where most of their, there's a big selling point around that. And you probably have heard over the years, their um, self-driving features are getting better and better. Um, and, and other features that are just super random. So I'm gonna play a short video that talks to um, their newest version that they launched about a year ago. And you'll see this is for a in-car, um, sort of in the infotainment system update. That's what this, this video is for. 
And, and you'll notice um, a couple things and we'll talk to it in a second. So right, like not a standard video you'd see for an update to a car system. Uh, very much a, a new product launch, if you will, or even, I mean, the music they put was like a club music and, and really, hey, we're trying to make this a big and, and amazing thing. And, and you'll notice a lot of the things in here have nothing to do with self-driving or nothing to do with owning a car. Um, it, it had to do with adding games adding Spotify, adding all these goofy things that you can add. Um, and now they, you can even watch Netflix and all this crazy stuff in the car, not while you're driving, so don't worry. But uh, they really wanted to make that a selling point and they took, um, took advantage of their, their population and, and sort of the, the community around them, following them to say, let's throw in some, some gifts and memes and really make this fun to get people to follow us more. So again, taking, taking uh, taking care of, of the and added features, some necessary, some not, and, and getting press around it, right? So pretty big one. On the flip side, there's far smaller ones. So I, I enjoy doing photography. So uh, here's a little one uh, sort of related, but Sony makes a wonderful set of mirrorless cameras. Um, and they recently, well, I think it's about a year ago too, but they added a firmware update to one of their products. So, and it would, it wasn't anything crazy, nothing like Tesla's video, but it was, you can now um, automatically track animals while you're taking video or, uh, or images and, and increasing speed and performance and battery life, right? All things that um, for, for this camera is sort of a professional grade camera that that user group would find value in. Um, and, and a lot of it comes down to if I anticipate or I know this company will continue to support and add features, it's a great example of a feature that came later down the road that helped them sell far more cameras than, than of having to set up an entire um, new sort of workflow and manufacturing house and, and new tooling and all of that. They could say, oh, well, if we build in a way to update firmware, we can now add these new features that knowing our consumer, we can, we can, we can say perfect and, and they'll buy more cameras or we'll grab more of that market. So not as exciting, but still sort of the, the real way of which you can capture that group. So a lot of things to consider, right? So when is it the right time to, to build one of these applications? What, what should they help facilitate? Um, how can you make sure that they add value and understand the privacy implications? Make sure you allow for sort of sales um, and a great experience, right? A lot of different pieces, some on business, and I think uh, some in sort of product and, and design world. And there's sort of this, this fight between the two of like, well, which one takes precedent? And I think that's, that's the balancing act that a lot of these companies have to take. Um, some it turns out really well, some it doesn't. And, and that's what we, we tend to see. Um, but there's a lot of things to consider, I guess, um, before you can sort of dive in and, and try and make the most informed decision you can. So I like to boil it down to sort of three things. Um, is again, going back to understand the problem that you're trying to solve, explore the needs of the user. And this could be super formal, this could be informal. Sometimes it's just having a conversation with those people. So that's something that uh, I do a lot um, as, as one of the designers on our teams is, let's just talk to the people using this, um, have a conversation. What is it that you're doing? Um, do observations, that kind of thing to see, okay. And then start asking questions. Oh, are you doing this to do X? Or is this because of the limitations that are set upon you um, or other things of that nature, right? So really get to what is this that you can help facilitate? In some cases, um, and this has happened to me several times, is 
you start going down that path and you say, cool, but if we did anything that we normally do, we were not going to solve your problem anyways, because the problem has nothing to do with, um, the problem is sort of upstream. Um, it comes far before we get involved in whatever we're, we're trying to help build. So if it's a piece of software, um, it's like, oh, where's the data coming from? And the problem is that, or, oh, where, who is, is getting this information? If it's about speed, oh, it, it only comes once a week. Oh, okay, well, we can't solve that problem if we can't control the data, right? In the, in the case of software. So really explore those needs. And I think lastly, then start looking at what solutions could look like. Um, and some of them are high, high fidelity, really high tech. Some of them could be no tech. Um, sometimes, honestly, we've put out solutions in, in my previous projects, which is like, let's create a process that makes sense for everyone. Um, and it's an understood sort of evaluation of, okay, do these steps in this order, make sure you communicate and send an email to these three people that you did those things. And then once that's done, like problem solved, right? Like it could be that low tech. So by no means am I saying you have to go high tech. In many cases, that's definitely not the solution. Um, but uh, there's sort of a, a, a whole range of, of pieces to go. And lastly, um, you really want to make sure your experience is smooth. So uh, I lifted this uh, gift from Westworld if everyone, anyone watches it, but uh, you, you re it really has to be, you'll notice great experiences are super smooth. And in many cases, um, how it's communicated is they're invisible. So you may have heard that before, good design is invisible. Um, and in a lot of cases it is, you never notice it because it's doing what you expect it to do. It's helping you do what you normally need to do. Um, and you can get on with your life um, as you do. And I, I think my team and my tech team is probably these two in the background saying, oh, that's cool <laughs> uh, in the GIF. So that's sort of uh, how I'm going to wrap this up a little bit. And if you enjoyed this material, I know Emily wanted me to make sure to say this too, but uh, this was actually lifted from a podcast that I host with one of my friends um, called Design Gold. So if you're interested to hear more about uh, this kind of material or just hear me talk about <laughs> random things. Uh, this is where to, to listen into some of that material. Um, we try and do it weekly. Um, every so often that doesn't happen, but um, if you're interested, that's, that's one place to look. Um, other than that, um, I'll say thank you and uh, I'll take any questions from the group. Emily, I'd ask a question. Uh, that, is that cool or are you gonna yeah, go do it? Go for it, we also are gonna take questions in the chat, but Jenny, feel free. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to, to jump in. No, you're um, good. What would you say would be like the best, uh, if, if you're a um, entrepreneur, you're thinking about doing an app, um, what would be like one or two ways you would suggest evaluating whether or not it needs to be an app and whether or not you're like on the um, right track? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think I think it's really thinking about um, outside of software or like outside of that solution. What's the problem? And is is there? I think the the one of the classic things is what are the competitors? And I don't mean that in the sense of what's the other piece of software. If we if you're imagining right, so I think there's there's this tendency in like if you have a bunch of people who are used to building software, the tendency to say our solution has to be software focused but really think about the competition as what are they doing today or what would they do instead of? Um, because in some cases it might be physically like going from location A to B on their own. Um, like if we didn't have phones, what would we do? And if we're in the same office, I'd walk across to the, to the other facility. So I think th that's sort of the mindset and it's sort of non-trivial if you will, but um, that's a good place to, to think about it. And I think then once you say, okay, we've, we've evaluated sort of what the use case is. And we think we think software is the right way to go. And you're thinking, okay, now there's a lot of different software platforms and, and places to play. Um, I think in, in the case of consumer tech, um, the, the sort of easy answer or the, the, the best answer today is a web application. So something that can run on almost any device, um, uh, phones, tablets, et cetera. If you're in a different space like enterprise, something like healthcare or aviation, I think there's different considerations um, because there's a lot of sort of legacy or older systems that you have to depend on. So I think uh, in that case, 
that would help facilitate it and, and uh, shadowing um, interviews. Um, those are always good exercises around um, understanding your, your user population. Um, let's see what else. I think that's a maybe hopefully that answers your question. It's a good, good starting place. Emily, I'm sorry, I haven't been reading the chat. If there's if there's ones in the chat, uh, let me open it. I can I can read from the chat then if that's helpful. Um, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. There are two questions that came in about how to estimate costs for developing an app. Um, one of them is a little bit more specific to uh, creating an app that's a companion to a, sp a spending tracker tool. Um, do you have any advice for how someone who's, who's thinking about building one out who's maybe not a technical person and maybe hiring a firm, um, like how they, or, or maybe looking to partner with someone, um, how, yeah. how, how does someone estimate costs or like, uh, or even get like a start budgeting for something like that? Yeah, so I think, I mean, so I guess, uh, I guess the, uh, my question is, is this looking as someone who has the skill set and you're looking to offer it or looking as in the other way around, you're trying to hire someone and trying to understand how much you want to spend. So uh, whoever asked that, if, if, you, if you have that piece, I'll, I'll talk more to it. It sounds like the second one based on oh, what Looking to hire someone. Okay. So I think, I think honestly, that's the, the trickier one. So I'm glad you, you mentioned that. I think it really comes down to, and this is the tricky part, especially if you don't have a technical background, a lot of it comes down to how comfortable you are with the other individual. So if you're if you're um, looking for cost range, I think I think folks, um, what I've seen the best is reach out to other companies, other folks that are in the space or may have some some concept of how complicated it would be. So sort of outside of the dollar range is okay. This application is going to do X, Y, and Z, which means I'm going to store data. I need login credentials. It needs to be up on the web and it needs to capture these types of things. Video, right? Like video is a big file. It's going to cost more to store it on a server. Text, cheaper, those kinds of things. Um, I think that's probably a good place to sort of investigate. So find some sort of tech friends, if you will. Um, that's a good place to start. And then I think from there, it's, it's thinking, uh, talking to a lot of people. So a lot of the firms that do development, design work, freelancers, a lot of them are willing to talk through this process with them, um, especially knowing that if it's not a big organization that they're working with, if it's a couple people, one people, it's like a startup, uh, they're much more willing to sort of have that dialogue. Um, and I would say, don't hesitate to ask questions. This stuff isn't straightforward, even for people in the industry. There's so many new terms um, and make sure to capture capture things like I would say do, a, do ask a couple different folks and make sure to capture what they're what they expect to do um, how they expect to go about solving your problem no, normally they give you sort of a write-up um, with one or two pages like hey I plan to build a web section and a database and this is how much it costs with these this is how many hours um, I plan to spend on that exercise um, that's that's a good place to go um, I think that talks to the cost piece. Um, let's see what else there is. And oh, and I guess now, how do you find a developer? So I think there's there's some resources online like um, Freelancer or Odesk, but I think what's it called now? Upwork. So Upwork is an open um, platform for that. Universities are another another good place, um, uh, another good place to sort of reach out to students. So in Pittsburgh, we have the luxury of Carnegie Mellon and University of Pittsburgh. Um, two big, big schools here, um, and, and their student population is a good place to reach out to um, because a lot of the times the students are much more willing to just get new work and to sort of play with the idea. So if you're, if you're willing to spend the time and work with them together to say, this is what I'm looking for, this is what I'm trying to do, um, your cost could be lower, and you might both sort of learn, have some skills traded between the two parties. So there's, there's a value there. If you're looking strictly just, I want someone to develop something and hands off kind of thing. Um, Upwork, there's some agencies. Um, I don't know them off the top of the head, but there's some small agencies um, that you could approach. Um, they normally are called like dev shops or, or something in that range, um, consultant firm or 
development and design agencies. Um, there's some, some in a lot of, I would say the ones locally to you are probably the best that are smaller. So like less than 20 people, um, as if it's just a startup kind of group, don't go to the really massive ones because they'll, their overheads are just way too high um, out the door. Um, hopefully that's, that's helpful um, to that question. Uh, Emily, what was the other one that you, you mentioned? I, I forgot it now that I've talked to her a bit, a couple minutes. No, I think that answers those questions. Um, I also put in a question, uh, since a lot of this presentation was about hardware, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on, uh, on websites that are built out that um, are considering having companion apps. Like I'm thinking also like about how Shine Industry has a website, but not an app. Yeah. Um, Talk through some of the similarities and differences between or behind why someone might have just a website and not an app, or why creating an app as a companion to a website or a web platform might be a good or a bad idea. Sure. Yeah, I think. I mean, so I think you'll notice that in in some cases, and and this is a, a I don't know what percentage, but there's a decent percentage of mobile applications that the only reason they exist as as standalone applications is to take up space on your home screen so that you're more likely to click it and buy something, right? So like the likes of Amazon, Wayfair, Facebook, their goal is to just get you to use the thing um, and you're more likely to make a purchase. But when you're starting out, um, now that the web technologies have gotten so good, you can, you can sort of build one application, a web application that is across the board. So Emily, in, in your case, Shine, right? It's a web application. At this point, uh, the value is, is there's, there's a huge cost between web where you have an entire population where anybody who has access to a browser can sort of play. Um, maybe let's say with 95% if you're using a really, really old browser, but uh, most of your people, if not all, can sort of interact where only a subset could if you did a mobile application and finding resources that understand that platform. So, um, Android has a couple different languages um, that you have to write specifically for their applications and you have to deal with things like um, distribution. So putting that on their platform, um, making sure you're updating and collecting information about that. And in terms of Apple, they, you have to either, their applications are built on Swift is the programming language or Objective-C. Um, I don't know if they still support Objective-C, I'm guessing they do, but those are the platform uh, languages they use and um, in, in their case, they actually have a, uh, a small fee of $100 that you have to pay every year in order to play um, on, their, on their platform. So I think if, unless there's something critical and, and what that critical would be is access to a camera. So if you're building a camera tool or something like that, then you may need to build a, a application for, for the device itself. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Some background location capture. So something like a running application. I want to track my runs. That may require um, a dedicated application because you the only way to access that, that information from the device is locally. You can't do that through the mobile web browser. Um, those are a couple of the examples. But I think unless you have that really strict need because of the product you're building, if you're just starting out and are trying to get uh, a big swath of people, especially in, let me say, caveat that within the consumer market, I think web is probably the best place to go. But if you know that, like, um, I know in some cases, some of the applications we worked on is they're um, like in game, like stadiums, like console um, energy center, like all of those folks are handed um, iPhones with scanners to scan your tickets. Um, and if they needed to do something like, oh, I need to request uh, another staff member to come help or those things, like that would be a reason to build that platform because that's where their entire um, team lives. But other than that, um, I would say web application is sort of the best place to go. You'll have the easiest time building something because there's a lot of resources, a lot of people are familiar, um, and you'll be able to sort of grow outside of one, one hardware device. So hopefully that answers your question, Emily, and there was value in there. Yeah, no, that was great. Thanks so much. Um, we have time for one or two more questions if anyone wants to ask. I do. I have a question. Um, so do you think it is better to wait? So I have a website. Um, it's fully, you know, 
built out. Do you think that a company that is looking at apps should wait until like we have a certain amount of following on like social media or a certain amount of, um, so we get our level business to a certain level before switching or even adding a web application. Um, what are some things to consider? So obviously you said, you know, the type of business or all that, but like what other factors would that be something to consider? Yeah, I mean, I think, so I think the case of um, maybe the distinguishing factor between a web page and a web app is like, is there logins? Is there credentials? Is there something that requires some data to be stored? I mean, at the very basic level, that's what it is. So anything that makes a purchase, something like in Shine's case, right, there's a login, there's a profile. That, that to me is, is a, in, the, in the bucket of it's a web application. Something static like uh, my web page, for example, it's just stuff that you can go look at pretty pictures and descriptions, uh, website. I think the decision between one or the other is, um, is it, are you trying to communicate um, sort of just content and you just want people to reach out something like a, like an agency, for example. So if you're offering services like that, then, then maybe you don't need a sort of web application because you really want that face to face or you want that dialogue to occur between you and your clientele and your web page is more of a entry point for them to come to you and say, yes, I'm, I'm interested in your services. I like what you have to say and you can build that narrative there. Um, I think that's probably a, a basic level answer. And I think the other piece that uh, sort of I, I didn't, didn't mean to forget is I would say all of the um, web applications and websites that you make today, whether you're building them yourself or using a platform like Squarespace or, or Webflow is make sure they're responsive. And by that, I mean that they work work well on sort of mobile devices and desktop browsers, um, because that's a lot of the traffic is now mobile first, not web, uh, desktop. So I think that's, that's something to consider too. Most of the, the platforms out there that use Webflow, Wix, Squarespace, they do it automatically. So you don't have to worry too much. Um, but if you're doing it yourself, um, something to consider. Um, and if uh, there's more to that, if you want more to that, you can just, I think Twitter, you can ping me there and I'll, I'm happy to continue chatting um, as well. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> An open invitation to tweet at Rehan. <laughs> yeah, go for it. That, that's probably the best place to get me. I'm, there's too many emails in my inbox, so I don't get to them as quickly. Um, so you can definitely hit me up there. Okay, thanks. Awesome. Um, so we have a little bit more time for questions. If anyone, I'm going to give it like five, four, three, two, one. Okay, then that's it. Um, so then to close out, I, I just want to say thank you again for everyone who's joined. Uh, once again, we are organizing these virtual learning hours slash business showers um, because we wanted to create an opportunity for folks to get online, see some friendly faces, uh, and also remind you to support uh, local entrepreneurs in your area and small businesses in your area. Uh, in this case, um, today's learning hours business shower uh, is to support Circles Pittsburgh, uh, which is truly a fantastic organization. I think Tammy is on. I can see her now. I don't know if you want to wave or say anything, Tammy, but you don't have to. <laughs> Um, we're so thrilled to be working with them uh, and we really, really want to encourage everyone who is here today or watching the recording of this uh, to check out the links that are going to be associated with this video. Um, we're going to include a link to the direct donation page as well as links to everyone's profiles. Um, I, since we have a little bit of time, Rehan, if you want to stop sharing your screen, I think I'm going to share my screen so that I can just walk folks through how easy it is to support somebody who's on China industry. Um, so we weren't planning, but we, we like to, you know, just go for it. <laughs> and so Carrie Ann asked one of the last questions, um, and this is her Shine Registry profile. Uh, so we'll be including a link to this, but you can see, I mean, it's a pretty basic setup. Um, Shine Registry is fairly straightforward, if nothing else. Uh, when you go to our website, um, well, I'll, I'll take you to the homepage first. When you go to our website, this is our, this is our homepage. Uh, you can maybe see some familiar faces from Pittsburgh right there under featured registries. 
Um, but when you go to find a registry, um, you can find folks more than one way. You can type in Pittsburgh, and this is our lovely list of companies that are based in Pittsburgh. It's a lot because uh, you know we love we love the Berg. Um, but you can also find folks directly by typing in their names or the, the name of their company. And so I wanted to find Carrie Ann. I want to see how I can support the work that she's doing uh, and how I can support her business at this time. You know, there's a little bit of information about her. Um, and one of the things that's pretty notable, I think, about the work that we're doing is that she's listed um, equipment that she's looking for that if you have a full color laser printer at home that you're not using, that's something that could make a really big impact on her business. Um, and she's also listed a few really, really small, quick, easy things um, that I'm going to fulfill now. I'm all, oh, I thought I was, I'm already logged in, so um, I don't have to do that, but I'm just confirming here that this is my information. This is the email address that she can use to get in touch with me to confirm that I'm, you know, one of her supporters and that I'm doing this. Um, and then I'm just hitting fulfill and that's it. And so what I'm going to do from there, because I said I was going to connect with her on LinkedIn, is I'm going to make sure that I go to the link to her LinkedIn page and sent her a little request uh, to, to, to be my friend on there. <laughs> um, so that is that as far as how quick and easy it is to uh, show folks on China industry that you're thinking about them, that, uh, that you know that right now is a kind of a particularly strange time for a lot of small business owners. Um, and, you know, I think it, it's, it really does mean the world um, to us at China Registry and to all the folks who are at Circles uh, that folks are participating with, um, with us on this, uh, on this Zoom call. But we really do hope that you explore the links that we're going to send out later as well and, and continue to stay engaged with the folks who were previously at Gallery on Penn, uh, but now doing uh, some pretty incredible work to, to take their businesses online. And, and who knows, maybe we'll see some apps in a few weeks or months or so.